I'd like to welcome you all to our midweek Lenten services. I'm Pastor James Siles from Salem Lutheran Church, um, just on the west side, uh, at, and um, really glad and privileged to be here, and, and such an honor to be able to exchange pulpits and certainly share with you God's holy word as we consider the theme, God on Trial. And we're going to specifically be looking at the focus of misconceptions, how people saw Jesus. With that in mind, we're going to begin with the first hymn, uh, hymn 581. God bless your word. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for consideration is found recorded in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But he insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we confess in our creeds that Jesus suffered, died, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He certainly suffered because we know that Pilate will have Jesus whipped. And if you remember, the whipping was extremely, extremely severe. Some would actually call it a, a merciful act because it really took a lot of life out of you before facing the cross. And therefore, the punishment of the cross would happen more quickly. I wouldn't call it merciful at all. The whipping usually was a handle with three straps, and at the end of the three straps was either tied bones or metal fragments, so that with every whipping, you wouldn't get a slap of the back. You would have the gouging out of flesh. We certainly know that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate and was crucified, especially because it was Pilate who gave the notice. Oh yes, Pilate washed his hands and, and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood, but it was Pilate who gave the command. Even though the crowd was yelling, crucify him, crucify him. So we rightly do confess that Jesus suffered, died, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate. What's amazing is that this very Pontius Pilate saw Jesus as innocent, and actually worked to get Jesus off, even though he was facing a crowd that was becoming violent, and an uproar was developing. You may think that Pontius Pilate was a very weak man, and you would not be guessing right. Oh, it looks like the crowd is having their way with Pilate. But Pilate was a ruthless ruler. In fact, we're told by Jesus earlier in his ministry how Pilate had actually taken and murdered some Galileans, took their blood, and mixed it in with their sacrifices at the temple. 
This is a man who made sure to keep the people in line. And now he has to deal with Jesus. We go back in time to the evening before. Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling council. It was actually the law at the time that you could not have a court case uh, going on outside of the work areas, work time. And so Jesus then would have been under trial during the off times. Remember that they work six days a week from six in the morning till six in the evening. But that didn't stop him in putting together this kangaroo court. Oh, they brought in all kinds of witnesses. They brought in all kinds of people who made um, accusations. The Bible says they couldn't even agree. Oh, they blindfolded him. They hit him. They abused him. Who's hitting you, they would say. And then towards the end, Caiaphas would finally ask Jesus point blank, are you the son of the blessed one? In other words, are you the son of God? Jesus didn't use the common word yes. Instead, he used the word, I am. The very word that was used at the burning bush when Moses would ask, who should I say is sending me? And the the very angel of the Lord, our very Savior before he took on human flesh, would tell Moses, you tell him I am is sending you. I am who I am. As soon as Caiaphas heard this, he ripped his robe, which was also against uh, the Mosaic law. Priest was never to rip his robe. But he ripped his robe, and the people started yelling out, blasphemy, blasphemy, he is worthy of death. Now the death that they could have easily carried out would have been the type of death that was known by the Jews, and that was death by stoning. But instead, they decided to take him to Pontius Pilate, where he would have to face death by crucifixion. So they show up early the next morning before the governor. Now they could not go to the governor and say to him, this is this Jesus claims to be the son of God. Remember, Herod was not a Jew. I mean, Pontius Pilate was not a Jew. Pontius Pilate could care less what the Jews probably taught. No doubt he had his multi-gods or maybe even emperor worship. But Jesus being the son of God, as long as he's not a threat to society, it didn't matter what he called himself. So they had to come up with three other charges against him. And the first one was, He's subverting the nation all the way from Galilee down to here. In the original language, the word subverting has the idea is he's going against the standards. He's not following the proper rules in how a person should be conducting themselves. And he's getting people to take his side. And then they go on to say that, well, he's opposing to pay taxes to Caesar. A pretty serious breaking of the law with that one, especially in the eyes of the Romans. But the truth of the matter is, less than a few days before, Jesus had told the crowd, give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. Jesus never opposed paying taxes. And then came the third one. He claims to be the Messiah, the Christ, and a king. By the way, they never called him king of the Jews. That was Pilate's way of mocking the religious leaders when he called Jesus the king of the Jews. Out of all three of those, it was only the third one that Pilate would actually interrogate Jesus on. Clearly the other two he knew were false and silly and and ridiculous. And when he even questioned Jesus on the third one, I have no doubt that he even saw that as being foolish and ridiculous because his interrogation was rather short. It didn't go on for hours. Witnesses weren't brought in or none of that usual court stuff. He just simply asked, are are you a king? And Jesus would reply, he was, and that his kingdom was not of this world. And after he hears all that, he goes out to the crowd and says, I find no basis of a charge 
against this man. He would simply beat Jesus up and send him back to them, send him back out into society. This was a waste of Pilate's time. But the religious leaders insisted, oh, they must have came up with even more accusations and, and, and even the one we have here being listed was very, very weak. Oh, they started talking about his teaching and questioning his teaching and, and then they even brought up about Galilee and as soon as Pilate heard that, he right away decided to send Jesus to Herod. Here was another opportunity to wash his hands of Jesus and not have to deal with it. Let Herod. So Jesus goes off to Herod. Herod was very glad to see Jesus. He looked forward to him. He wanted to ask him all kinds of questions. And in fact, he wanted him to do a sign. Oh, that means a miracle. He, he heard about these miracles. Wouldn't it be great to see one of those so that he could be awed as well? But Jesus did nothing. Even when he was being asked questions, Jesus wouldn't say a word. Oh, the religious leaders started accusing him, and, and I wouldn't doubt that they were accusing him of the very things that they had brought up with Pilate, maybe probably even adding to that. Because at the end, Herod goes and puts an elegant robe on him. Some believe that that elegant robe was simply to treat Jesus as a clown. I tend to lean towards, because they accuse him of being the Messiah, a king, that that elegant robe would have been a robe of a nobleman. And therefore, a very beautiful robe, but one to mock him. Because Herod was done with him. It is fascinating to hear that in all of this going on, we get this little bit of tidbit here, a little bit of information that Pilate and Herod couldn't stand each other. They were enemies. But from that time on, they became friends. And what was the one thing that they would have in common now? Hating Jesus. The religious leaders certainly hated him. They wanted him dead. And when we look at those religious leaders and, and what they were saying about him, it is not surprising that they actually wanted him dead. They saw him as a threat. They saw him as someone opposing their control and authority. You, you got to understand that they were under the old covenant, but they had abused the old covenant. They had turned the old covenant, which was to prepare them for the new covenant, which was to point, point them to the fact that they were sinners who needed a savior and instead turned the old covenant into works you needed to perform in order to earn God's favor. And therefore, God will take you to heaven because you're good for goodness sake. And when Jesus is coming and preaching the gospel and talking about forgiveness and talking about sins being paid for and the hope of everlasting life in heaven, people started to follow him. People weren't giving to, to the church and therefore supporting these religious leaders. They were giving to Jesus. They were supporting Jesus. They were listening to Jesus because he was giving them hope, especially by letting them know that all those Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in him. He is the long-awaited Savior. Because Jesus was a threat to these religious leaders, they were convinced he had to die. That would be the best for this nation. Oh, it would be the best for them. At least that's what they thought. Pilate... He could care less what Jesus taught. His heart was hard. He believed in his own religion. And by the way, when it really comes down to it, you can really sum all religions and put them in two categories. Either it is God who saves you or you save yourself. Either it's going to be the good news that your sins have been paid in full or here's what you need to do to earn God's favor. 
The sad truth is, is the religion that, that calls for you need to do it is always going to be a religion based on doubt. Did I do enough? Did I try enough? Did I mean it enough? Did I care enough? Am I good enough? But knowing that God has done it all, knowing that God has paid for it all, there is no doubt, but only knowing that in Christ Jesus, heaven is my home. Because he has done it all. And yes, it is finished. So Pilate, with his religion, not caring about what Jesus said, didn't even want to listen to what Jesus said and rejected his word immediately. Herod, he was glad to see Jesus. But then Jesus turned out to be a disappointment because Jesus didn't live up to his expectation. And the truth is, is when Jesus doesn't live up to your expectation, you will always be disappointed with him. You will find yourself even hating him because he's not the Savior you want. But Jesus didn't come to be the Savior that any of us wanted. He came to be the Savior that we all needed. And what kind of Savior do we need? We need a Savior who's more than just a king and more than just the king of the Jews. We needed a Savior who was the king of kings. A Savior that could do what no other king could do. Not even King David could do this. And that is rule with justice and righteousness forever. The two things that is needed for our salvation, and Jesus did them. You and I need justice. And in fact, God demanded justice because he demanded that the punishment, to sin, the, the punishment for sin is death, and we needed a Savior who would suffer that punishment and pay for that punishment and whose payment would be credited to us because this is not a punishment that any of us can pay and live. And we needed a Savior who would be righteous. We needed a Savior who would keep the law perfectly because in order to go to heaven, God demands holiness. He demands this righteousness. Yes, righteousness means to be right with God, but I always see righteousness as the ticket to heaven and by his perfect life and offering that perfect sacrifice on the cross. You and I in Christ Jesus alone, through faith in Christ Jesus alone, have the righteousness and therefore the ticket to heaven. We needed a king who was going to be like no other king, a king that not even David could be, a king who would establish a kingdom that would be forever. And in order for a king to do that, he would have to conquer death. He would have to rise again. And we needed a savior who would say, because I live, you too shall live. And in Jesus, there is life after death. Yes, Jesus is the Savior we badly need. He's not one Savior among many. He's not one Savior that we think maybe we could want. No, he's the Savior we need. For there is no other Savior who is called the King of Kings. This is Jesus, your Savior. This is your hope. This is your comfort as you live each moment of every day knowing that heaven is my home. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which